The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Chapter 21 Down a dry red world of Kafakthun, in the middle of the vast rendit lit of the desert, the sage technicians are testing the sound system. Let us say the sound system was the desert, not the technicians. They had retreated to safety of disaster area, giant control ship, which had in a width some 400 miles above the surface of the planet. They are testing the sound from there, here, there. Anyone within five miles of speaker silos would have survived, would, wouldn't have survived the tuning up. Rather than have been about within five miles of speaker silos, the inspiring thought would have been that in both size and shape, the sound would be closely resembling Manhattan out of silos. The neon phase speaker stacks towered monstrously against the sky, obscuring the banks of plutonium reactors and semantic sim- Somatic amps behind them, buried deep in the contract bunkers, beneath the city of speakers, lay the instruments for that in- the magicians, musicians control from the ship, the massive photon guitar, the bass detonator, the mega drum, drum complex. It was going to be a noisy show. Board a giant control ship, all its activity and bustle, hot black de zero's limousine, a mere tadpole beside it. It arrived and Dot and the mated gentleman being transported down the high voltage corridors to meet the medium who was going to interpret his psychic impulses into the air-jar-tar keyboard. A doctor, a Lugitudinian, a marine biologist who had, just, oh, had also just arrived, loaded in for an unknown expense from the mega magnium to try to reason a lay singer who locked himself in the bathroom with a bottle of pills, refusing to come out, till he had proven conclusively to him that he wasn't a fish. The bass player was busy, was busy playing, busy miskeying in his bedroom, and the drummer was nowhere on board. Frantic inquiries led to discovery that he was standing on the beach of Sagaritmus V, over a hundred light years away from where he claimed he had been happy. For half an hour now, I found a small stone that would be his friend. The band's manager was profoundly relieved. It meant for the 17th time on this tour, the drums could be played by a robot. Therefore, his timing of symbolics will be right. The sub ether was buzzing with communications of stage technicians, testing speaker channels. It was that that was being relayed to the interior of the black ship. The day's occupants lay against the vo- back wall of the cabin, listening to the voices of monitor speakers. OK, channel 9 on power, said the voice. Testing Channel 15, now a thumping crack of noise walloped through the ship. Ch- channel 15, OK, said another voice. A third voice cut in. A black stunt ship is now in position, it said. It's looking good. Going to be a great stone sun dive. Sound computer online. Stage computer online. Computer voice answered. Online, it said. Take control to the black ship. That ship locked into treachery form on standby. Testing channel 20. The other leaped across the cabin and switched frequencies on the sub ether receiver. For the next, my impulsive noise hit them. He stood there quivering. What? said Trinity in a small, quiet voice. The sun dive mean. It means, said Marvin, the ship is going to dive into the sun. Sun dive. It's, only, it's very simple to understand. What do you expect if you still have a backs? The there's a stunt ship. Well, you know, said the other pod, a voice that would have taken a vegan snow lizard, would make a vegan snow lizard feel too chilly. This is the help back, help back, back, these are a stunt ship. Simple, said Farbin. I parked it from him. And why didn't you tell us? You said you wanted excitement, adventure, really wild things. This is awful, said Arthur, unnecessary, a pause of fo- which followed. That's what I said, confirmed Marvin. 
On a different frequency, the sub ether receiver, I picked up a public broadcast. Now echoed through the camp around the cabin. Why am I up for the concert? Here this afternoon, I'm standing here in front of the stage, Porter lied, light, in the middle of the redneck desert, and in aid of the hyperonic glasses, I had just about make out the huge audience carrying here on the horizon, all around me, high in me the speakers that rise like a sheer cliff face, high above me in the sun, shining away, he doesn't know what's going to hit it. The environmental lobby do know what's going to hit it, and they claim the concert will cause earthquake, tidal waves, hurricanes, imperial damage to the atmosphere, fear, and all usual things that you can environmentally usually go on about. But I'm just about, uh, but I just as had a report that a representative of the disaster area met with an environmentalist at lunchtime and had a mall shot, so nothing now lies in the way of. So if I switched it off, turned to Ford. You know what I'm thinking, he said. I think so, said Ford. Tell me what you think I'm thinking. I think you're thinking it's time we got off this ship. I think you're right, said Zephyrpod. I think you're right, said Ford. How, said Arthur. Quiet, said Ford and Zephyrpod, we're thinking. So this is it, said Arthur. We're going to die. I wish you'd stop saying that, said Ford. It's worth repeating at this point that the theories that Ford came up with on his first encounter with human beings to account for their particular habit continue stating, stating the very, very obvious is that it's a nice day, or you were very tall, or this is it. We're all going to die. His first theory was that if human beings didn't keep exercising their lips, their mouths probably shriveled up. After a few months of observation, came up with his second theory, which was this. Human beings don't keep exercising their lips, the brains start working. In fact, the second theory is more literally true. The back could work on people, a cut of stone, stone. The Cacrinian people used to cause great resentment and insecurity among neighbouring races by being one of the most enlightened, accomplished, above all, quite civilized, quite civilizations in the galaxy. The punishment for the behaviour which are held to be offensively self-righteous and prerogative, a gigantic, gigantic term of tribunal inflicted on them the most cruel of social diseases, tepopathy, consciously in order to prevent themselves from causing even the slightest fault that crosses their minds to anyone in the five mile radius. They will now have to talk very loudly, continuously about the weather, their little aches and pains matched their, this afternoon, and what a noisy place Cafoon has suddenly become. Another method of temporarily blotting out their minds to play host to a disaster area concert. Time the concert was critical. Ship had to begin is now before the concert began in order to hit the sun six minutes and thirty seven seconds for the climates of song with which it related. So the light solar flares had time to travel out to Christopher Fan. The ship had already been diving for several minutes by the time that Paul Prefect completed his search for another compartment's black ship. He burst into the cabin. The sun of Cafetoon loomed terrifyingly large at the vision screen, its blazing with furnace, a fusing hydrogen, nuclei growing moment by moment. As the ship plunged onward, unheeding and trumping, thumping and banging as if for its hands on the control panel, Arthur and Trillian had little fixed expressions and rabbits on their night road, who think that the best way of dealing with the approaching headlights is to stir them to stir them out. Silverwood turned around, wild eyed. Ford, he said, how many escape castles are there? None, said Ford. Silverwood delivered. Did you cut them? He yelled. Twice, said Ford. Did you manage to raise the stage crew on the radio? Yes, said Silverwood bitterly. I said, I, I said, there were a bunch of people on board. They said, they, they, he said to say hi to everybody. For Google, Google, Google. Didn't you tell them who we were? Oh, yeah. Is it a great honour? That's something about a restaurant bill and my exec- executors. Food pushed it off her side roughly, leaned forward over the control console. Does none of this function? He said savagely. All overridden, smashed is the powerful bullet. Find it first. Nothing connects. 
There was a moment of cold silence. Arthur was stumbling around back of his cabin. He stopped suddenly. Incidentally, he said, what does Tudderbolt mean? Another moment passed. So the others turned to face him. Probably the wrong moment to ask, said Arthur. He said, so I just remember hearing the word, you used the word a short while ago. I can only bring it, I, I, I only bring it up because where, said Fulford Poe, quietly, does it say teleport? Well, just over here, in fact, said Arthur, pointing dark control box, a real cabin, just on the words of emergency, above the big word, symptom, and the size of signs saying out of order. The pandemonium that instantly followed. The only action to follow was that Paul Fulford lunging across the cabin to the small black box, Arthur indicated, and stabbing repeatedly at a small box. Small, single small button to set it, 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 but a small black button to set into it. A six foot panel set up in beside it, revealing a compartment resembled a multitude, multiple shower unit. It found a new function in life, the electrician drunk store. Half finished wiring hung from the saline. A jumble of abandoned compartments lay spoon on the floor. Program flannel panel loomed, looped out of the cavity in the wall into which it should have been secured. Junior disaster accountant visiting the spaceship where the ship was being constructed. It demanded to know of the works for them. Why the hell they were fitting an extremely expensive teleport into the ship? She only had one important journey to make. That a man to form in Spain in the the light teleport they were ten percent discount. The accountant explained that this was in part material. Foreman had explained it was the finest, most powerful and significant teleport a money could buy. The accountant explained that the money did not wish to buy it. The foreman had explained that people would would still need to enter and leave the ship and the accountant had explained the ship had sported perfectly serviceable door. The foreman Explained that the accountant could go to boil his head. The accountant had explained to Foreman the thing approaching him rapidly with his left was a knuckle sandwich. All the explanations had been concluded, work was discontinued on the teleport, and which subsequently passed unnoticed. The invoice has such an oblivious five times the price. Hell's donkeys, murmured Zemberford, as he and Ford attempted, sort out, sort of mangled. The tangle right wiring. At a moment or so, Ford told him to stand back. He tossed the coin into the teleport and juggled a switch on the rolling control panel. With a crackle and spit, spit of light, the van okay and vanished. That's, that, that's much of it works, said Ford. However, there is no guidance system. A matter of transference teleport. No guidance programming could put you, well, anywhere. The sun of Calafoon loomed huge on the screen. Who cares, says Zabavon. We'll go where we go. And, said Ford, there's no water system. We can't all go. Someone had to stay and operate it. A solemn moment shovel passed. The lone loom larger and larger. Hey, Marvin, kid, said Zabavon, brightly. How are you doing? Very badly, I suspect. Muttered Marvin. A short his white rail later, the concert of Catafoon reached an unexpected climax. The black ship, with single morose complement, a plunged schedule, nuclear furnace of the sun, massive solar flares licked out for millions of miles into space, filling, in a few cases, spinning the dozens of so flare riders who had been coasting close to the surface, sun of appreciation, a moment. Moments before the flare light reached cover soon, a pounding desert cracked along a deep fault line, a huge and hitherto undetected underground river lying far beneath the surface, gashed to the surface, to be followed seconds later by eruption of millions of tons of boiling lava that flowed hundreds of feet into the air, instantaneously vaporizing the river, both above and below the surface of an explosion, Echoed to the far side, the world and back again. Those very few who witnessed the event survived swear that the whole hundred thousand square miles of desert rose in the air like a wild thick pancake, flipped itself over and fell down again, back down. 
that precise moment, swaying the irradiation, the affairs filtered through the clouds of vaporized water, struck the ground. A year later, a thousand square meter desert was thick with flowers. The structure of the atmosphere around the planet was subtly altered. The sun blazed less harshly. In the summer, cold bits less bitterly cold. Bitterly. In winter, pleasant rain fell more often than slowly. The desert world of Kofun became a paradise. Even in telepathic power, which was the people, Kofun had been cursed, permanently dispersed by the force of the explosion. I spoke some of the disaster area. One had it all about. Had the all environment is shot. Was Lady Quinter saying a bit of a good gig? Many people spoke movingly of the heavy lean powers of music. A few skeptical scientists explained the records of the event more closely. Examined the records of the events more closely and claimed they had discovered faint visionaries of vastly intelligent artificial induced improbability field. Drifting in from a nearby region of space. Chapter 22 Arthur woke up and instantly regretted it. Hangovers he had, put another anything on this scale. This was it. This is it, was it. This is the big one. This was the ultimate pits. Matter transparent beams, he decided, are not as much fun as they say. A good solid kick in the head. Being for the moment unwilling to move on account of a dull, stumping throb, you experience it lay a while and thought. The trouble with most forms of transport, you thought, is basically that not one of them is worth all the bother on Earth when they had been on Earth before they demolished it to make way for a new hyperspace fast bypass. Probably been with cars. The advantages of old pulling lots of black, sticky slime from the ground where it had been safely hidden and hauled away, turning into tar to cover the land with smoke to fill the air with even pouring the rest into the sea, all seemed to outweigh the advantages, being able to get more quickly from one place to the other, particularly when the place you arrived at would probably come as a result of this, very similar to the place you had left, i.e. covered with air, tar, full of smoke and sort of fish. And what about and about the matter transference beams? A form of transport which involved tearing you apart atom by atom, flinging those atoms through the subject ether, then jamming them back together. And then just when you're not getting when you're getting your first taste of freedom for years had to be bad news. Many people and it would have scared that thought exactly and that thought exactly this many people I thought exactly this before, Arthur Dent, and even got to links of writing a song about it. Here is one that you use regularly to be chanted by huge crowds outside the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation, Citroen Sports Systems Factory, and Happy Worldly, Worldly Free. Our brand name's great, okay. Our goal is pretty neat. But Gary's Eve, pretty girls, will knock you off your feet. They do anything you like, real fast, they're real slow. But you have to take your part to get me there. Then I won't, don't want to go. See, so take me apart. Take me apart. What a way to roam. You have to take me ap- apart to get me there. I'd rather stay at home. Serious is a pave of gold. So I've heard it said. But, but not, by nuts who then do they go on to say, see too before you're dead. I'll gladly take this high road, or I'll take the low. But if you have to take me apart to get me there, then I, for one, won't go. So you take me apart, take me apart, you must be off your head. If you try to take me apart to get me there, I'll, right, I'll stay right here my, in bed, and so on. Another favourite song was much shorter. I transported home one night with Ron and Sid and Meg. Ron stole Maggie's heart away. I got Sidney's leg. Arthur felt the waves of pain slowly receding. Through, though he's still aware, a dull, slumping throb. Slowly, carefully stood up. Can you heal that dull, slumping throb? Throb, said the prefect. Now Arthur spun around. 
or bothered uncertainly, for all perfect was approaching, looking red eyed and pasty. Where are we? said Gaius Arthur. Ford looked around. They were staying in a long, caving the corridor. Curving corridor that stretched out of sight in both directions. The other steel wall was painted with thick, sickly shade of pale green, and using schools, hospitals, and mental asylums to keep the inmates subdued, curled over the tons of their heads to where it met an inner perpendicular wall, which oddly enough was covered in dark brown, this in whirl wave. The floor was dark green rubber. rubber. So we move over, over over to a very thick, dark, transparent panel set in the outer wall. It's several layers deep, yet through it, it you could see pinpoints of distant stars. I think we're in a spaceship of some kind. He said, down the corridor, and sound of a dull throbbing throb. Truly, he said, after, uh, never seen Zephyrpod. So the full struggle, nowhere about. He said, I looked. They could be anywhere on own program teleport can throw you light years light years in any direction. Judging by the way I feel I should think I feel I think do you think we'd travel a very long way indeed. How do you feel bad? Do you think they are where are they? How are they? That's, there's no way we can know. I know we can't do anything about it. Do, do what, do what I want, do what? Don't think about it. Arthur turned his thought over his mind, reluctantly. Saw the wisdom, it tucked it up, put it away. He took a deep breath, footsteps, exclaimed Ford, Ford. Suddenly, where? That noise, the stumping thud. Pounding feet, listen. Arthur listens, noise echoed round the corridor at them. From an indeterminable distance is a muffled sound of pounding footsteps, inevitably louder. Let's move, said Ford sharply. They both moved in opposite directions. Not that way, said Ford. That's where they're coming from. No, it's not, said Arthur. They're coming from that way. They're, they're not there, the boy. They both stopped. They both turned. They both listened intently. They both agreed with each other. They both set off in opposite directions again. Fear gripped them. From both directions, the noise was getting louder. A few yards to their left, another corridor ran into right angles to the window wall. I ran into it and held it along it. It was dark, immensely long. They passed down it to give them the impression that it was getting colder and colder. Our corridors gave off, Kate gave off it to the left and right. Each very dark and each objecting them to sharp blasts of icy air as they passed. They stopped for a moment in alarm. The further down the corridor they went, the louder became the sound of pounding feet. They pressed themselves back against the cold wall and listened furiously. A cold, a dark and drumming of disembodied, disembodied feet was getting to them badly. Ford shivered partly with the cold, but partly with the memory of stories. His favourite mother used to tell him when he was a big, mere sip of a mini beganese. Ankle deep high to Amphibian mega grasshopper. Stories of death ships, haunted hulks, and roam wrestling round the Rodrasa Skura regions of deep space, infested with demons, a ghost of forgotten crews. Story two incautious incul- travellers who found and entered in such ships. Stories of when full remembered a brown Hitzian wall weaved in the first corridor and pulled himself together. How will go- ghosts and demons may choose to decorate the death hoax? He said to himself, he would lay any money if it li- he liked. It was, wasn't with Hitzian wall wave. He would grasp off upon the arm. That, that way he came. He came. He said firmly, and they started to retrace their steps. Only that they leaped like a startled lizard down the nearest corridor direction. And the owners of drumming feet suddenly hove into vogue directly in front of them. Hidden behind the corner, they googled, googled in amazement as about two dozen overweight men and women panted past them in track suits, panting and wheezing in a manner that would make a heart surgeon.
stared over it, stared over them. Druggers, he says, the sound of their feet echoed all the way up and down the network of corridors. Druggers whispered the infident. Druggers said full prefect was shrugged. The corridor concealed in was not like the others. It was very short and ended. A large steel door. Four designed it to discover the opening of mechanism and pushed it wide. First thing that hit his eyes what appeared to be a coffin. The next 4,999 things that hit his eyes were also coffins. Chapter 23 The vault was low ceilinged, dimly lit and gigantic. At the far end, about 300 yards away, an archway led through to what appeared to be a similar chamber, similarly occupied. Full prefect let out a whistle. No whistle. As he stepped down onto the floor, the vault wild, he said. What's so great about dead people, said Arthur, nervously stepping down after him. Don't know, said the fold. Let's find out, shall we? On close inspection, the coffin seemed to be more than sarcophagi. They stood about the waist high, with scratching in what appeared to be white marble, which was marble, certainly it was. Something that only appeared to be white marble. The tops of similar translucent, and though they could dimly be perceived, could be dis- perceived the features of the late and previously, previously lamented occupants, they humanoid. They clearly felt the death of troubles of whatever world it was they came from, far behind. But beyond the little else could, would be discerned, rolling slowly around the floor between the sepulchre with a giant oily white guest, which Arthur at first thought to be there to give the place a little atmosphere to discover that it was froze his ankles. So Crawford too was intensely cold to the touch. Full suddenly crouched down between one of them, right inside one of them, pulled a corner to his towel out of his satchel and started to rub furiously at something. Look there, plague on, on us. And on, on, look at there, there's a plague on this one. He explained to Arthur, it's thrusted over. He read the first clear and examined the grieved characters to Arthur's. They looked like the faint prints of a spider. They had one too many, whatever his spiders have on nights out. The full didn't see recognized early form of the galactic and an easy did. <clears throat> it says, good to finger come out. Arc fate, tip B, hold seven, telephone sensitizer, sensitizer second class and seal number. A said telephone sensitizer, said Arthur. A dead fellow telephone phone sensitizer, this kind. But what's he doing here? Paul peered through the top of the figure of in. Not a lot, he said. A suddenly fresh one of those grins of his, which always make people think he's overdoing things. Recently, and could. She tried to put get some rest. He scarred over the next sucker for us. A moment's brisk town work. He announced, This one's a dead hairdresser. Help me. The next death sarcophagus revealed itself. The last resting place of advertising account, account executive. One after that commanded, condemned a second hand car settlement and third class. Birch and hatch led into the floor. So he caught Ford's attention. He squatted down and fastened it. Flashing away the clouds of freezing gas, Fred had developed him. A thought occurred to Arthur. If those are just coffins, he said, why do they, they keep us so cold? Kept so cold. Oh, indeed, why are they kept anyway? said Ford, chugging the patch way to open. The gas poured down through it. Why, in fact, is anyone going. What is. Why, in fact, is anyone going to all the trouble and expense of carting 5,000 dead bodies from space? 10,000, said Arthur, pointing to the archway through which the flex chamber was dimly visible. Ford struck his head down the floor hatchway. He looked up again. 15,000, he said. That's another one lot down there. 15 million, said the voice. That's a lot, said Void. A lot, a lot. Turn around slowly, barked the voice, and put your hands up. Any more of a move, a blast you into tiny, tiny bit. Hello, said Ford, turning around slowly. 
put his hands up and not making any move. Why, said Arthur Dent, isn't ever, ever, isn't anybody ever pleased to see us? Dan insulated in the doorway, through which they entered. Bar Bolt was a man who wasn't pleased to see them. His pleasure was communicated partly the barking, hectoring, hectoring quality of his voice, and partly the viciousness in which he weighed a long silver kill of Zap the gun at them. The design of the gun had clearly had not destructed the bait, but the bush, make it evil, he been told. Make it totally clear that this gun has a right, has a right end and a wrong end. I think it's totally clear if anyone's standing on the wrong end that things are going badly for them. If that means sticking all the sorts of spikes and prongs and blacking out bits all over it, be, then be so. Then it be so. But this, this is not a gun for hanging over the fireplace, sticking on the, to the road of stand. It's a gun for going out and making people miserable with. Ford and Arthur looked at them gun unhappily. A man with a gun moved from the door and circled around them. As he came to light, they could see the black and gold uniform which the buttons were so proudly polished. They shone with intensity. They would make that would make an approaching motorist flash his lights in annoyance. He just at the door, the door out. He said, "People who can supply the counter firearm don't need to supply verbs as well." Ford and Arthur went out, so they were closely followed by the wrong end a kilo zap gun and buttons. Turning to the corridor, they jostled by twenty-four oncoming joggers. Now a shadow had changed, who swept on past them in the vault. Arthur turned to watch them in confusion. Move, screamed the captor. The captor. Arthur moved. Full shrugged and moved. In the vault, joggers went to the twenty-four, went to the twenty-four, uh, twenty-four empty cigar fry, on the side, opened him, climbed him in, and fell into a 24-hour dreamless sleep.